Hello and welcome. I'm Cherry Gregg. When most people go to the doctor, they think it is their doctor that treats them. And while this is true in some respects, doctors rely heavily on medical technology to reach a diagnosis. In developing countries, as much as 40% of the medical equipment in hospitals is out of service. Technology, like incubators that can mean life or death for a premature baby, is in need of repair. Many times, the repair is simple, a new fuse or wire, but there is no one around with the skills required to fix the problem. Engineering World Health is a nonprofit organization that sends young engineers to developing countries to fix vital medical equipment and train technicians. Take a look. Hospitals in developing nations are working overtime. Medical infrastructure is weak. Resources are in short supply. Millions of dollars worth of medical equipment is donated every year to the developing world. Much of it goes unused. The problem is, equipment breaks. Frequently, there is no one who knows how to repair it. Instruction manuals, if any exist, often need translation. What cannot be repaired is put into storage and wastes away. Solving these problems takes skill and ingenuity. Engineering World Health and its Summer Institute program send students with backgrounds in math and science to developing countries to fix machines one by one. Parts are scarce. The students must use imagination and applied skills to create inventive solutions to repair medical equipment. Opening up the first piece of equipment and looking at the first circuit board, I was just completely intimidated. But um, after a while, we got into the swing of things, and what do you like? I feel like I made a huge difference. Students take all the theories they've learned in the classroom and implement them in the most challenging of real-world hospital applications. They drill and solder, thread and test. Some of the fixes are simple, some are complicated. All of the repairs can save lives. This is an electrocardiogram and blood pressure reader that we fixed. It took us three days to take it apart piece by piece until we found a break in a circuit the corrosion and it took us another day to put it back together but now that we finally see it working in the hospital it makes me feel really good about what we're doing here. My name is Dr. Osvaldo Mercado and I have worked with Engineering World Health for almost 10 years. Each year the students come they made a major impact by fixing some hospital equipment. We value our relationship with the students and engineering world health. I'm holding a newborn baby here and I'm, this is really exciting. <laughs> I helped translate the English manual into Spanish for this infant radiant warmer. Throughout our month here in this hospital, we've definitely had a lot of interaction one-on-one -on -one with patients. Um, so not only do we get to you know, work behind the scenes and work on the infrastructure of this hospital, but we get to see firsthand the um, impact it makes when we see that our patients are actually using the equipment that we have dealt with and, uh, and to see the effects that they have on their lives and on their health. The summer program is two months long. The first month focuses on language and cultural understanding. The second month is spent by students working at hospitals partnering with Engineering World Health. Students fix medical equipment, which immediately raises the standard of care at a beleaguered hospital. A change that can last for years. And as is often the case, the ones giving receive the greatest gifts. Students develop traits they will carry throughout their careers and lives. Creativity. <laughs> Endurance. Innovation. Service. Humility. Resourcefulness. Dedication. Transformation.
Here with us today to talk more about engineering world health is Dr. Mohamed Kiani. Dr. Kiani is a professor and chair of the Department of Mechanical Engineering here at Temple University. He is also one of the founders of Engineering World Health and has dedicated his life to finding ways to help young engineers use their skills in practical, socially responsible ways. Thank you, Dr. Kiani, um, for joining us today. Engineering World Health does wonderful work all over the world. Please tell us, um, how did you come up with the idea for starting this organization? So as you said in your introduction, I'm a professor of engineering. And if you think about engineering, it's a very tough profession in terms of academics. You have to do a lot of studying. It's a rigorous pro uh, field of study. So uh, myself and Dr. Malkin, who was the other per professor who founded the organization with me, we were thinking always that uh, engineering students need to be more socially engaged. Engineering students tend to be sometimes these hard-working, sometimes, mm -hmm. you know. Because those programs are tough. Yeah, sometimes geeky students who are very focused on developing new ideas and designing things, mm -hmm. but they sometimes tend to be not as socially uh, engaged. And we thought that they need to be more socially engaged, and especially because we think they can make a big impact in the world. Engineering has made a big impact in the world, and they can change lives, they can make the world better. Mm -hmm. And so we started discussing this, and we were wondering what could we do to get our students more involved, and what could we do to make a bigger impact in the world. And so we started thinking about this issue of the developing world and how we can have an impact in the developing world, especially in the area of healthcare, which is an area that's lacking in many areas in the developing world. Now, we, we, now tell me about the actual problem. And, and how you connected bringing engineering students to fix this particular problem. So as you said in your introduction, if you think about the last time you were in doctor's office, almost everything you went through from being way to from the doctor listening to your heart with a stethoscope to taking an x-ray from mm -hmm. taking medicine and all of that, if you think about all of those, all of these involve applications of technology to your health care. And so in that sense, all the doctors are doing are essentially applying technology to improve your health care, to take care of you. Mm -hmm. The problem is that in the developing world, this technological aspect, this technological medium that you need to, to help uh, take care of people either does not exist, or if it, do, if it exists, it's very minimal, or it's not functioning properly. Okay. And so on top of that, the people who, have to supposed to, who are supposed to take care of these, which are engineers and, and technicians, mm -hmm. do not have the proper training and the proper equipment and the proper means to take care of this. Now, I understand, like, could you tell me, that a lot of this equipment is imported from other countries, right? Yes, that's true. So this equipment, a lot of this equipment is imported from uh, mostly developed countries like United States and Europe, and a lot of it is donated with, with very good intentions. The problem is that when they get there, first of all, a lot of them do not apply to the disease models that they have there. Okay. And also, a lot of them tend to break down, a lot of them tend to not work. So one example, which is kind of scary when you think about it is mm -hmm. w that we see almost always when we go to one of these clinics is baby warmers. And so in the uh, developed countries, these baby warmers have feedback systems which essentially test, uh, check the temperature of the body of the mm -hmm. baby, make sure it doesn't overheat, make sure it doesn't burn the baby. Okay. These feedback systems burn out and don't work properly after a while. So what they do in, those con in, in these developing country hospitals and clinics, they have a nurse who's standing there and is touching the baby. The, the so the, the nurse is standing there. And touching the baby to mm -hmm. make sure that the, the baby is not being overheated, is not being burned. Because wow. the system is not working, because the device is not working properly. Mm -hmm. And there are simple solutions to this. These things can be fixed. We have also developed, so for example, Engineering World Health has developed a new technology where it doesn't need that feedback, and it can automatically sense that using newer, newer technologies that are available, mm -hmm. we have developed a very cheap and very uh, workable uh, device that, uh, that we are now using in a lot of these clinics. And we have also, we go through and we fix a lot of these, these equipment. And we also train a lot of the local personnel to, to take care of this equipment on their own. So how did you link, how did you uh, figure out that sending students to these countries to do, the, to do those things, like train the, the, um, the folks there and also make those small fixes, how did you link that together? So as I said, we were hoping that we could get our students involved in this process mm -hmm. also, because engineering students, after they go through their initial couple of years, they are pretty capable. They can fix things, they can figure things out. So we decided that this would be a good life-changing experience for students to mm -hmm. go to an environment like there. They not only help the people who are back there, but they also will benefit from it. And so we started sending these students, so what they do, they go through 
they get trained on, on some of the specific issues of developing world technologies and developing world clinics. Mm -hmm. They also learn a little bit of the language if they don't already have that. How long do they train? So the, the training is about a month. Okay. But uh, remember, again, these are students who already have taken classes, who already mm -hmm. have some background in this area. And then they, take the, 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 they go through this training on, uh, in, the, in, the, in the place. So they, they, they go there and they get trained at the place that they're going to be working at. Mm -hmm. And then they, they spend another month then working and, and helping the, 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 the place and then fixing things. And some mm -hmm. of these students go back. Some of them come back and volunteer for us to, to go as a professional, on professional visits and so on. So this is not the end of the story by any mm -hmm. means for them. So um, they go there for about a month and they, they learn, and this all takes place in the summer, right? Yes, this is during the summer, so mm -hmm. this is essentially their summer vacation. Okay. Rather than spending it around and partying, mm -hmm. which is not bad, but still, they would rather, they go there for one month, they get trained, for, then they spend a second mm -hmm. month working in the hospital or in a clinic. They also live with a local family. Oh, wow. And then so it's they, like an exchange program? Yes, so they, they live with a local family, they learn about the daily lives of these people, and they learn how these people live. And they also get to do a lot of work in the hospital or clinic that they're assigned to. And mm -hmm. they usually work in teams of two, so there, there is some camaraderie and, and some teamwork that, that goes into this also. So do the students, the students actually train the people there as well? Yes, the students do some training of the people there. Mm -hmm. And they also, uh, so one of our models is that we want to make ourselves obsolete. Our goal is not to be doing this uh, at every hospital forever and ever. What we want to do is we want to bring up the local standards so they can take care of themselves. And so th uh, the students, while they're there, they do a lot of that kind of work. They, they help these technicians. They help the local personnel and bring up their skills and their mm -hmm. skill sets. But we also have other programs, for example, where we send uh, train people to go and conduct classes, for example, in Rwanda and so on, which you, mm -hmm. I think you will, later on we will talk about, where we actually uh, train, uh, have formal training programs mm -hmm. for technicians and for local engineers that they can bring up their level of skills so they can take care of this, this problem on their own. So how are the people there? How do they um, regard the students and how accepting are they of the program? They love it. I think, you know, as soon as you go there and you talk to these people th who work in these clinics, uh, to talk to the administrators, the physicians, the nurses, they realize, they know where the problem is. They know that they're lacking in terms of technical support, in terms of technological support. And when we tell them that we're going to send you engineering students and engineering personnel to help you and to bring up the level and to also train you and mm -hmm. bring your level of uh, confidence and ability, they love the program. They are very supportive of it. And they're, the only shortage that we have is more people. They, they keep asking us for more. They keep asking that we should send more people. Mm -hmm. And also, they, they, they also love the fact that they get to live with the local family and get a sense of the local place and, 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 and so on. So when the students come back, what is, what is their feedback? What do they say about their experience? So when they come back, they have a debriefing. And they have a kind of a, what we call a reverse culture shock. So they've lived in a place mm -hmm. sometimes without electricity, sometimes with very limited resources. And they come back to the U.S. and suddenly they realize, wait a minute, there's a warm sho shower here and there mm -hmm. is a hotel here and there is a, you know, the, the, everything works uh, mm -hmm. or most things work and, and things are working well. So there is that reverse culture shock. So when we interview them, the word and the expression that universally they all say that, we've been running this program for about 10 years, is that they say this is a life-changing experience. Life -changing. So this is not a one-way uh, work in that they, they do support the local mm -hmm. clinics and the, the clinics and hospitals in the developing world, but the program and seeing that and living in that environment greatly impacts these students. The lives of these students is never the same. They are changed for the better, mm -hmm. and they will be changed for the better. Many of the students come back here and, and continue to work in these areas, continue to support efforts to help the developing world. Several of them have started their own organizations to help the developing world in different ways. Some of them have developed technologies that are very appropriate for the developing world. And I, did, did some of the, did the students realize the type of practical application that all the things that they were learning um, could have in the world? I think when they go in, most of them don't realize what they're getting to in mm -hmm. that sense, in that mm -hmm. they, they, they think, okay, this is, I'm going to go there for a couple of months, and then I'm going to come back to my life. Everything is going to be the same. But when they go there and they go through this experience, when they come back, their life is never, never going to be the same. Mm -hmm. So in addition to gaining engineering experience and hands-on experience that 
good for them and gaining experience that's going to be good for them in terms of finding jobs and things like that. Mm -hmm. As I said, their life has changed. Their view of the world has changed. They realize that not everybody is as lucky as they are and not everybody has everything that they have. And they need to be more involved. They need to be, uh, have a bigger impact in the world around them. Uh, and they, they realize that they can change the world for the, 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 the world for the better. So your goal of helping students become more socially responsible is actually being brought to fruition through this program? Yes, very much so. I think, as I said, if you talk to these students when they come back, uh, it's, it's pretty impressive how, how they have changed mm -hmm. and how much they have helped other, you know, the, the clinics and, and the developing world, but also how much they themselves have changed. These young people in their 20s, early 20s usually, mm -hmm. how much they have changed, young women and men, you know, how, how, how much they have changed and how, they, 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 how, how much their view and their worldview has changed. That is so wonderful. Thank you, um, Dr. Kiani. You have given us wonderful, wonderful information. Um, uh, Engineering World Health has, implement, has implemented its services in countries all over the world. Um, as Dr. Kiani mentioned, one of the examples is um, in Rwanda. Take a look at this video that was produced by Engineering World Health. We have data from about 200,000, 300,000 pieces of equipment in 30 or 40 countries around the world. Anywhere from 40 to 95 percent of medical equipment in developing world settings is not working. We have a second study which looked at about uh, 3,000 pieces of broken equipment, specifically looking at why that equipment wasn't working. Actually, we found that 70 or 80 percent of the medical equipment could be put back into service without importing spare parts. The biggest problem is trained personnel. There just aren't enough trained technicians on the ground to repair the equipment. In the fall of 2009, with funding from the GE Foundation, Engineering World Health began a three-year mission to train 45 Rwandan hospital technicians how to keep valuable equipment up and running. With direct cooperation from Rwanda's Minister of Health, Dr. Richard Saizabera, the Biomedical Equipment Technology Training Program was launched. Through this course, students for the first time uh, learn electronics and medical courses and all about medical equipment. Benefits of BMED training were immediately recognized in Rwanda. EWH Executive Director Melissa Beard and EWH staff members Kostika Uitanzi and Laura Perry visited the hospitals of BMED students after they had received just one session of training. The biggest thing that I take away from it is just the immediate impact that it's had. Um, the fact that the students have been able to go out after such a short period of time and start making repairs that make a difference. At Bataro Hospital in the Barrera region, blood pressure cuffs that leaked air were being thrown away, but replacements were not easily found. When the hospital's BMET students returned from the first round of training, they repaired dozens of faulty cuffs. The fix was an old-fashioned one. Immerse the cuff in soapy water and follow the bubbles to find the leak. It was so easy and simple. One guy from Bumba Hospital, that weekend he, he, he go back to his hospital, mm -hmm. he repaired 15. 15 blood pressure cuffs in one yeah, weekend. in one weekend. Rescuing fallen equipment is undeniably cost effective for the hospital, but the impact on the quality of Rwandan health care and the lives of Rwandans in general goes beyond dollars. Most of Rwanda's 10 million residents live in the countryside. Few have transportation options beyond their own two feet, a bicycle taxi, or the occasional bus. Traveling to receive medical care is often a full day commitment or longer. Imagine giving up a day's pay of $1.39 in order to reach the hospital with an injury that needs x-ray, only to find the machine is not working and won't be for some time. So what do they have to do? They either have to find transportation to take them to another hospital or 
that person has to get themselves to another hospital, have the x-rays taken if the x-ray machine is working at that hospital, bring those x-rays back in order to be examined by the physician at, at that hospital. That is a common, everyday experience in the vast majority of hospitals in developing countries. This scenario of a broken x-ray machine happened in 2010 at Rwanda's Gisenyi Hospital. Smaller hospitals send their own patients to Gisenyi for x-rays. The machine can service 20 to 25 patients a day when it's working. If the machine is, is not functioning, so there is a, a big problem in the diagnosis right. for, for medical doctors and for the, the, the care of the patient. The good news? This machine was eventually fixed. The hospital's maintenance employee, Celestine, was already a BMET student in training. Using skills learned in BMET classes, Celestine was able to troubleshoot the problem, a blown fuse. An almost insignificant item, but unrecognized simple solutions like these have sidelined equipment before in Rwanda and beyond. About half of everything that's donated or half of everything that's out of service could be fixed generally for less than $50. Um, so oftentimes the fixes for the equipment are really doable um, and really easy, but they're not easy if you don't have access to locally available resources, if you've not been taught um, in any way about simple fixes. And the need is global. It's not just in Rwanda, but, and it's not just in Africa, but it is global. Every country has a problem with a large amount of medical equipment being put out of service for oftentimes very, very basic, very simple faults. With BMET training, this trend can be altered. It's already happening in hospitals throughout Rwanda. For the short time already he has taken the program, there are many equipment he, call, he can now repair, which he would not do before the, starting the program. At Rawama Ghana Hospital, Dr. Jean-Claude Endijamana has already seen his BMET student making repairs that normally would have required a five to ten day wait for an outside expert to handle. Dr. Endijamana expects doctors and certified biomedical equipment technicians will soon work hand in hand as a partnership that will continue to improve the health care for all Rwandans. Cost effective, innovative, and fully sustainable the Biomedical Equipment Technician Training Program funded by the GE Foundation and implemented by Engineering World Health is designed to be transitioned over to local educators after three years. At the same time BMED students receive certifications, Engineering World Health will have trained and empowered a new staff of local educators for future classes. I would like to say that BMED is a cure. In other words, we go into the country, we install the program, we get local trainers to eventually take over the training for us and in fact that has been successful in Ghana, in Honduras and in other countries. Unfortunately I'm afraid to say that we will probably be doing this forever. I think there will always be poverty. There will always be countries that don't have enough people who are technically trained to deal with their medical problems and their medical equipment problems. Welcome back. Melissa Driver Beard is joining us through Skype. Melissa is the Executive Director and CEO for Engineering World Health. She has more than 15 years of experience working at nonprofits such as the American Lung Association and the American Cancer Society. Melissa, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Please tell me, um, what has been the response to Engineering World Health's work in Rwanda? response really has been overwhelming, um, especially by the people and the government of Rwanda. Um, we've enjoyed an enormous amount of cooperation from the Rwandan Ministry of Health. The minister himself, Dr. Richard Sazabera, has been extremely supportive. And uh, we've already trained 16 students there and expect to have an additional 15 coming in in March for the first part of their training. 
That's great. That's great. So I don't think people, just so people can really understand the impact of, you know, out-of-service equipment, the, the impact that it can have on a hospital, could you explain how many people are actually impacted by this, um, by the equipment not working? Sure. Um, the statistics that I can give you particularly re relate to Rwanda, even though we're currently running programs in Rwanda, Cambodia, Honduras, and Ghana. Our best numbers are coming out of Rwanda so far. That's where we've been able to do the most research. Um, like I said, currently we have 16 students that have been through two training sessions. Those training sessions have been eight weeks each, and they've been over the course of the last nine months. Mm -hmm. During that period of time, those 16 students have been able to put over 350 pieces of equipment back into service, and those pieces of equipment have in turn touched the lives of over 60,000 patients in Rwanda. Wow, that's a lot of folks. I mean, tell us some of the, what are the types of equipment that the students repair? Um, honestly, a little bit of everything. Um, on our assessment trip to Rwanda, I guess about a year ago, we noticed that there was a good deal of the sterilization equipment in the country that was not working, so we made that one of our first priorities. But over the course of the training sessions and over the course of the last nine months, students have learned how to repair items that are as small as blood pressure cuffs and as large as x-ray machines. Um, one of really the best success stories has come from an x-ray machine in the Kisenyi district, which is near the Congolese border. and. A student in the class um, hadn't had much training, wound up in this tech position, attended the class and came back to his hospital where the x-ray machine had been down for over six months. Wow. The hospital director relayed to me that that particular x-ray machine, when it's in service, should see about 25 patients a day. So over a six-month period of time, that's 25 patients a day that hadn't been able to receive care and had been shuffled off to other hospitals or in minor cases had um, you know, not even gotten an x-ray at all. Mm -hmm. um, so the student basically was able to take a look at the x-ray machine after his training and determine that really the only issue with it was that it had three blown fuses. Wow. A blown fuse is readily available even in Rwanda mm -hmm. and they're very inexpensive. So he was able to make that fix and put the piece of equipment back into service very easily so then the hospital director relayed to me that he was so excited about that because 25 patients a day were then able to be seen. So that's 25 people who were coming to the hospital that didn't have to wait, that didn't have to lose their average income of less than $2 a day. Wow. And that's, you know, it parlays into resources that the hospital didn't have to spend on transportation to get them to another hospital. Um, you know, it has an enormous trickle-down effect into the life of an individual patient as well as to the economy of the community as well. Now, I understand that in, in a country like Rwanda, most people don't live close to the hospital, so they actually have to travel long distances to get there. So this saves them from making additional trips, doesn't right. it? Right. That can't be the case. Um, there are larger cities within Rwanda where people and, you know, the population is around a hospital, but that's certainly not always the case. Mm -hmm. um, there can be any number of instances where patients are walking for hours or for a you know quite extended period of time into a hospital. Um, so there's a good bit of wait time involved. It's it's not a situation that we as Americans are used to at all. Um, you know, for example, if I have some sort of sickness, I'm within a few miles of Duke University. Mm -hmm. I go to the hospital, I can see any number of doctors and specialists on the same day and get any number of tests on that mm -hmm. same day and possibly even get the results. In most developing countries, it simply doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's highly likely that you would get yourself to a hospital after an extensive journey. Um, you'd be giving up your day's income because if you don't work, you don't get and paid. And you actually can't afford and to have it. Yeah. You may come to get a diagnosis um, you know, let's say you're even being tested for HIV AIDS or for malaria. Well, if the microscope's broken, you can't get your diagnosis. If the x-ray machine is broken, you can't tell whether or not you have a broken bone. Mm -hmm. So it really does complicate matters and make it much more difficult for a patient to receive a timely or an accurate diagnosis. Now, I think that's one thing that, you know, a lot of Americans take for granted is that, you know, most of the time when we go to the hospital, everything's working properly. So right. now, how do you how do you get your funding, and 
um, for these types of programs and are you relying on donations from individuals like our viewers? Um, we've been very fortunate and a good deal of our funding for the BMAP program in particular has come through the GE Foundation. Uh, they made enormous equipment donations to all four of the countries in which we're operating BMAP programs and really saw this program as being a way to build the capacity within the country to handle their own projects and they also saw it as a very sustainable program in that when Engineering World Health exits the country after about three years, those countries will be able to take the program on themselves. We train the trainers, we train educators, mm -hmm. so that they can build this in as part of a certificate program or a diploma program and keep training new biomedical equipment now, technicians each year. However, that said, we do rely on donations um, and are happy to take any kind of individual donation. You can find out more about all of our programs and the work that we're doing globally at EWH.org. Wonderful. Well, Melissa, thank you so much for all the great information that you've provided us today. Um, and another thank you to Dr. Kiani as well. Um, well, that's all we have. Both of the videos for today's show were produced by Engineering World Health and provided to TUTV. For more information on Engineering World Health, including on how you can volunteer or provide donations, you can go to www.ewh.org. For Temple University and TUTV, I'm Cherry Gregg. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for watching.